For the happiness of Hazrat Zahra Marzia, for the enlightenment of the graves of your Marhumin, of the graves of Shahida, Alama, and Siddiqin, for the safety of the followers of Ahl al Bayt around the world, and for the safety and the hastening of the reappearance of Hazrat Baqiyatillah al A'adam Marwan al Fida, please recite your loudest salawat. All praises you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who is Rahman and the one who is Rahim. The one that has given us an opportunity to sit again in the remembrance of Abu Abdullah in these ayam e in these majalis that have the ability to reform and take a person towards salvation, towards completion. But Abdullah is that individual, Karbala is that place, the day of Ashura is that day where something so unique happened that throughout the annals of history, nothing like its sort has ever been seen. Karbala is no less from amongst the Sha'air of Allah. If on one side you look towards the Hajj and you see Hajra running between Safa and Marwa seven times for the sake of her son, for the sake of the Prophet of God, and that act of Hajra is loved so much by Allah that He says in the Holy Quran, in the Safa wal Marwa min Sha'airillah, that Safa and Marwa are from amongst the Sha'air, are from amongst the signs of Allah. Or if Ibrahim is seen stoning the Satan three times that action is loved by Allah so much that it becomes an integral part of the Hajj or if you see Ibrahim ready to slaughter his son Ismail and Allah loves that action so much that he makes it an integral and obligatory part of the Hajj and all of those actions of Ibrahim Hajra and Ismail become Sha'air Allah, if they are from amongst the Sha'air, then Karbala is no less a Sha'air of Allah. If Hajra ran between Safa and Marwa seven times for the sake of Allah, for the sake of the Prophet of Allah, then Hussein also had a Safa and Marwa in Karbala. His Safa was the Khaymaga, his Marwa was the battlefield, and he didn't run just seven times, but tens of times, bringing back the the bodies of various companions. If it was the body of Burair, going to the body of Abu Thamama, going to the body of various different members of Ahl al Bayt, back and forth Hussein ran between his Safa and Marwa. If Ibrahim stoned the Shaytan three times, Hussein was surrounded by thousands of Shayateen and he stoned them with his sword, he attacked them with his spear. If Ibrahim Ibrahim was 
willing to sacrifice Ismail and that action became Sha'air of Allah. Hussein showed within his actions that I can give a son like Ali Akbar. I can give a son like Ali Asghar raising the six month old child in his hands. He looks towards the heavens. My Lord, this is easy for Hussein to bear knowing that you are watching. Karbala is no less a Sha'air of Allah. If Hajj is from amongst the Sha'air of Allah, then Karbala is no less a Sha'air. Karbala is that place which takes a person towards perfection, towards reformation. And one question I ask everywhere that I go in these ayam is this, that 10 days of the day of Muharram have passed us by the the day awwal, the second, the third, ten, uh, the third, third of the holy month. And now we've entered into suffer. I need to ask myself, what change has there come in my life from the first of Muharram until this point? Can I say that I have removed certain aspects, negative aspects of my personality? If I was an individual that would do ghibah, that, that would lie, that would be angry, that would have hasad, if I had these problems in myself, can I say after the first of Muharram, after the day of Ashura, I have changed myself, I have made myself a better person. If I cannot say that, then I have not understood Karbala. I may have come and wept and gained dry eyes. I may have come and beaten my chest. I may have scored my back with gashes or my head with gashes. But Karbala is far more more than that. See, Karbala is about reformation. It is about change. About Abdullah, when he gives his letter to his brother Muhammad Hadafiya, he says, When He says, I'm going out in order to seek reform. Reform within the Ummah of my grand father by enjoining good by forbidding evil I'm going to enjoin the good I'm going to forbid the evil how are you going to do that ya Aba Abdullah he says by walking upon the path of my grandfather and my father Ali Karbala is about reformation if I am exactly the same, I haven't become one iota closer to Allah, then I haven't understood Karbala. Yes, it's a byproduct that one tear shed for Imam al Hussein, Yuhtu Vanub al Idam, it consumes every single one of your sins. Imam al Baqir says, one tear that falls from your eye for Aba Abdullah, hearing the musibah of Imam al Hussein, equivalent to the wing of a mosquito, if it was to fall from the eye of an individual, that would form a barrier for him on Yom al Qiyamah between him and the fire of hell. One tear for Aba Abdullah. But there is a greater purpose to it. There is a greater level than that. That if one tear consumes all the sin, forms a barrier towards hell, what can be greater? He says, no, introduce the intellect. Bring the apple into it. See, now, before when you were crying, and all your sins were being annihilated. They were being burnt away like wood dries, uh, like fire burns dry wood. But now you introduce the intellect. Now the riwayah changes. It says, Man baka alil Hussein, arifan bihaqqihi, the one that does buka over Imam al Hussein, who wails over Imam al Hussein, understanding, arifan bihaqqihi. He's introduced the intellect now. He knows why Imam al Hussein went to Karbala. He understands the purpose of Sayyidu Shahada. He understands what it is that Imam al Hussein went through, for what purpose. 
purpose, who it is Imam Al Hussein went to Karbala for. Now, when he does buka over Imam Al Hussein, he wails over Imam Al Hussein. Wajibat lahul Jannah. Jannah becomes wajib upon him. See the difference. One tear shed without ma'rifah of the Imam, all the sins are consumed. But now you shed a tear with the ma'rifah of the Imam, and Jannah becomes wajib. Take the ziyarat of Sayyidu Shahada. See, Imam al Hussein has such a unique position, I said. That when you go around Karbala, you will see a hadith that is written around the haram that says, Ya Hussein, you gave everything for the sake of Allah, thus Allah gave you three things in return. The first, shifa'a in your turbat, shifa'a in the earth of your grave. The second, imamat in your lineage. And the third, Ijabatu dua tahta qubbe. The third is the acceptance of dua under the dome of Imam al Hussein. See, when you go to Mashhad and you stand in front of Imam al Radha's dome, it says, when you see the gumbad, the dome of Imam al Radha, three dua you are granted by Allah. Whatever three dua you ask, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants them. Then they say you enter into the dharih and you look at the dharih of Imam al Rada, you get another three dua. Any three dua that you want, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers them. But Aba Abdullah is that Imam that if you stand underneath the dome of Sayyidu Shahada, the narration says that there is an unlimited supply of acceptance by Allah. No matter how many duas you have no matter how many times you ask from Allah Allah will continue to give for the sake of Abba Abdullah there is no restriction when it comes to Sayyidu Shahada when you go for the ziyara of the Imam the narration says man dar al Hussein kaman zar Allah fawqa arshi the one that does the ziyara of Imam al Hussein it is as if he gets the thawab as if he were to do the ziyarat of Allah upon the throne, on the arsh. Anyone who goes on the ziyarat of Imam al Hussein, he will be given the thawab of someone as if the person has done the ziyarat of Allah upon the arsh. It's not that Allah sits upon an arsh, it's metaphorical. <laughs> it's metaphorical, it's not exactly like that says that if Allah were to sit upon a throne and if there was to be a thawab associated with seeing Allah sitting upon the arch, its, it's equivalent would be in Karbala. But he says, now you go on the ziyara of Sayyidu Shuhada Arifan bihaqqihi, understanding, having ma'rifah of the Imam. Man zara al Hussein Arifan bihaqqihi, wajibat lahu al Jannah. Now Jannah becomes wajib upon that individual. Why? Because Sayyidu Shuhada gave everything. Everything is unique in Karbala. And there are so many different lessons. And the main lesson of Karbala is the one of reformation. If 32 years of my life I have listened to the majalis of Imam al Hussein, and yet I still have pride, yet I still have anger, yet I still think ill of other people, yet I still do ghibah. This isn't me understanding Karbala, this is me fulfilling culture. And Imam al Hussein transcends culture. See this journey every year that we embark on, where we come and we mourn Sayyidu Shahada, when we come and we weep over Imam al Hussein, the journey is towards Allah. If I have not found more concentration in my salah, I'm doing something wrong. After in these 10 nights of mourning for Sayyidu Shahada, if now I do not find a new found level in my salah and in my ma'rifah of Allah, then I'm doing something wrong. Why? Because Sayyidu Shahada himself says, when he's leaving Karbala, when he's leaving Mecca, heading towards Karbala, he says, "Man kana bazilan muhjata wa muwattilan ala liqa illa fal yarhal ma'na inni rahilun musbihan insha Allah." He says, "Those of you that have made a firm intention 
to spend your blood in our way and have made a firm intention to meet with Allah. فَلْيَرْحَلْ مَعْنَا إِنِّي رَاحَلٌ مُصْبِحًا إِن شَاءَ اللَّهِ Then come with me, for I, Hussein, am leaving Mecca in the morning. The journey in Karbala is towards Allah, is towards the ma'rifah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is a journey towards Tawheed. Sayyidu Shuhada came to teach us higher understandings of Allah. But if I haven't changed, if I haven't done anything with myself, then what I've done has been wasted. Because the whole purpose is to change, is to reform, is to be, become better. It's to free ourselves from the shackles of the dunya and to live free above everything. Sayyidu Shahada, he gives his Ali Akbar, he's given his Abbas, he's given his Qasim, he's given his Ali Asqar, he's given everything. His body covered in the blood of his loved ones. He stands there and he addresses the army of Yazid. And he says to them, in lakum yakum lakum deen. He says, if you don't follow a religion, and if you do not fear the day of judgment, at least be free men in the dunya. At least be free. Don't be bound by the norms of society. Learn to transcend beyond. He's speaking to the army of Yazid. Says, at least be free. After when? After he has given his Ali Akbar, he's given his Abbas, he's given Ali Asghar. No one is left. And he's still saying to them, Abu Abdullah is that Imam, that Kareem Imam. You know when we recite in the Ziyarah of Friday towards our Imam, Kareemun min awlad al kiram, the magnanimous Imam from the children of those that are magnanimous. Kareem Imam. See, what is the difference between Jud and Karim? What is the difference between being Jawad and Kareem? Jawad is generous. Sometimes we mistranslate Kareem as generous as well. But there's a difference. The Kareem is Jawad as well, but the Jawad is not Kareem. See, the Jawad is generous. He gives, but at the back of his mind, there is the desire for a return on investment. He gives knowing that he will get something in return in the hope of that return, he gives. But the Kareem is the one that gives and does not care whether he gets anything in return. And this is why we refer to Ahl al-Bayt as Kareemun min awlad al-Kiram. That even when he's lying there in his own blood and no one dares approach him, and then they say Shimmer comes towards him, he kicks him, he sits on his chest, he says, I saw the lips of Hussein move. He says, I placed my ears by his lips, and he was saying to me, Shimmer, don't do this. Don't seal your fate towards hell. Can you imagine how Kareem Imam al Hussein is? That even at that point, he's saying, don't kill me. Not out of fear. Saying, don't kill me. I don't want you to go to hell. Because if you kill me, you are going to hell. See, the Imam is Imam for all, regardless of who they are. He says, don't kill me. Otherwise, you'll seal your fate. Kareem Imam. The one that is so generous, that is so magnanimous, 
and he takes everyone under his fold. All it takes is a person to take a step towards him. And those individuals, that's what we'd say the shahada, are unique as well. That's where he is addressing the army of Yazid, having given all his family members, having given all his companions, he says to them, Kunu ahraran fi dunyakum. But just before that, when the battle was in its height, in the heat of battle, Umar ibn Sa'ad turns to Umar ibn Hajjaj. He says, what's going on? It's a handful of these men, there's 72 of them. And why are there so many of ours dead? So go talk to the troops, do something. So Amr ibn Hajjaj goes in front of the army of Yazid. He stands in front of them. He addresses and says, Ya Hamqa, O oh, Ahmaq, O oh, people that are dumb. He says, do you not understand who you are standing in front of, who you are fighting against? says haulai fursanul misr wa fursanul har says you're fighting against men who are the best of the best you're fighting against free men men who are rushing can't wait to reach death men who are welcoming shahadat even the army of yazid are saying these are fursanul har these are free men and every single one of these individuals you see in Karbala, each of them have this unique ability, have this unique status. And inshallah, we'll talk in the next two or three majalis about these individuals. We're going to look at the rejas, the poetry that they recited when they went out. Obviously, every single one of the companions recited poetry some introduced themselves some didn't even introduce themselves they would just go out and give the stance their aqidah or what they believed in today i want to look at abu thamama saydawi abu thamama is that individual who was with amirul mu'minin in sifin he's with amirul mu'minin in jamal and he is there in kufa when muslim ibn aqil comes to kufa he gives bay'ah to Muslim. When Muslim is arrested and all of Kufa is placed under um, martial law, Abu Thamama Sayyidawi with great difficulty escapes Kufa and comes towards Karbala. The day of Ashura dawns and the fight is ensuing at the time of us, uh, at the time of Dhar, Abu Thamama Sayyidawi comes to the Imam. He says to him, he says, my, uh, my Imam, he says, I wish that I recite my last salah on this earth behind you in Jama'ah. At the time of dawn, in the heat of battle, Abu Thamama Sayyidawi is coming to the Imam, he's saying, Uhibbu, I wish, I would love to recite my final salah behind you, O Imam before I leave this dunya. Imam turns around to Abu Thamama. He says, Zakartu Salah. He says, you remembered Salah. Ja'alakallahu minal musalleen. May Allah raise you amongst those that are the ones that are regular in their prayer. He says, Allah bless you. And this, when you see those individuals that are related to Ahlul Bayt, that are associated to Ahlul Bayt, and their love of Salah, you have people like uh, Hajar ibn Adi. When Hajar ibn Adi is about to be killed, he says what? Give me the opportunity to pray two rakat salah. Look at Muslim ibn Aqil. Before Hazrat Muslim is killed, he says, give me the opportunity to recite two rakat salah. Forget those adults. Look at the sons of Hazrat Muslim. When they're about to be killed, they say, give us opportunity to at least pray two rakat salah before we're killed. And now Abu Thamama is saying, Dawi is coming to the Imam in the heat of battle. Yabna Rasulillah, I want to pray my final salah behind you. Imam says, May Allah raise you amongst the Musalleen. Says Abu Thamama, if you wish to pray, then go and ask them for a ceasefire. Abu Thamama is saying, Dawi goes to the battlefield. He says to them, Allow us to have a ceasefire so that we may pray salah.
At that moment, Sayyidu Shuhada sets up the Salah. Behind, the army splits in two, because it's Salat al-Khawf, one raka'ah each. Imam stands there. As the Imam begins to recite the Adhan, someone shouts over from the army of Yazid, says, Hussein, what Salah for you? Your Salah is not accepted. What are you praying for? And this is the moment that Habib ibn Mudahir takes out his sword. He turns to Imam Hussain and says, Ya ibn Rasulillah, this Salah of mine, I will pray behind your grandfather in Jannah. Ya ibn Rasulillah, I will convey your salams to your grandfather and your father, Amir al muminin And then Habib goes out, he fights at that point, and that's when Habib is killed. Anyhow, Abu Thamama is Sayyidawi, requests the Salah. And inshallah, we'll talk more about the story of Habib, maybe tomorrow or the day after, if we get an opportunity. Because there are a number of things that happen during just this Salah. Many of the companions that died during this Salah. Anyhow, Sayyidina Shahada leads the Salah, and Abu Thamama Sayyidawi comes to him, Ya ibn Rasulullah, give me permission now to go out and fight. Imam gives Abu Thamama permission. Now Abu Thamama mounts upon his horse, and he rides out. The maqtal says the following, ثُمَّ بَرَضَ أَبُوْ ثَمَامَةَ سَيْدَاوِي وَقَالْ And then Abu Thamama Sayyidawi came out and he was saying, أَزَاءٌ لِآلِ الْمُصْطَفَى وَبَنَاتِهِ عَلَى حَبْسِ خَيْرِ النَّاسِ سَبْتَ مُحَمَّدٍ He says, condolences to the family of the Prophet and his children upon the killing of his son, of his son Hussein. أَزَاءٌ لِلزَّحْرَاءِ النَّبِي وَزَوْجِهَا خَزَانَةَ عِلْمِ اللَّهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ أَحْمَدٍ Says condolences to Hazrat Zahra and her husband, the possessors of God's knowledge after Rasulullah. أَزَاءٌ لِأَهْلِ الشَّرْقِ وَالْغَرْبِ كُلِّهِمْ وَخُزَانٍ وَحُزْنٍ عَلَى حَبْسِ الْحُسَيْنِ مُسَدَّدٍ he says, and condolences to all of the existence, all of the people from the East and the West. And woe, huzn, sadness upon the madhlumiyah, upon the oppression that is being done to Abu Abdullah. In one line, look at this. This is a man that is going towards his death. In the heat of battle, when Imam is saying, Kunu ahraran fi dunyakum, or Amr ibn Hajjaj is coming and saying, These are Fursan ul Har, the people that are with Abu Abdullah, they're free men. They're not bound by the boundaries of that society, they're not bound by the ideals of that society. Because on the other side, you have people like this. On the other side, you have people like Ubaidullah Harr al-Jafi. Imam comes to him and says, Ubaidullah, you fought against my father Ali in Sifin. You did not aid my brother Hassan. But Ubaidullah, I am giving you an opportunity. Come join me. I guarantee you the shifa'a of my grandfather on Yawmul Qiyamah. Ubaidullah Harr al-Jafi says what? Says, Ya ibn Rasulillah, here is my sword, it is the sharpest of swords. And take my horse, it is the fastest of horses. Imam says, I don't want your horse or your sword. I want you to come and join us. He says, Ya ibn Rasulillah, I can't come and join you. I can't come and join you. And he doesn't join Abu Abdullah. Imam al Hussein comes to him directly. Come straight to him, face to face, and says to him, Come and join me, I guarantee you, Shafa. He says, I can't join you. He says, Take my horse instead. And at times I think that maybe sometimes we're also in the same boat as Ubaidullah al Jawfi. Someone asks us to do something for the cause of the Imam. Come to the Husayniya, vacuum the Husayniya, or come help open the Husayniya, or help us build a new Husayniya, whatever. We have these, and when we say, oh, well, here's my money, but don't ask me to come early and open and warm the center up. That someone else can do that. I will just give you the, and Ubaidullah Huda Jofi is saying what? Don't ask for me to come and help you, but I'll give you the money that you need. And we do that for the cause of the Imam all the time.
So uh, Imam used to help orphans. Okay, you know what? I, can't, I haven't got time. You know, I work nine to five. It's a big problem for me. So let me just give the money. I'll give the money, inshallah, the orphans will be aided. I don't like Huran Jofi is doing the same. He's saying, I'll give you the money, I'll give you the resources, but don't ask for me. Imam is saying, we want the person. If these individuals are about Umar ibn Sa'ad on the other side, Imam goes to him, Umar ibn Sa'ad come, says, Ya ibn Rasulullah, I know you're on haq. This is Umar ibn Sa'ad. says, I know you're on haq. However, I have a family. Imam says, we'll afford them protection. Says, I have property. Says, we'll replace that property with property from uh, the uh, stock of Bani Hashim. He says, uh, they will, I fear for my own safety. Says, we'll provide you safety. Says, but they have offered me the governorship of Ray. And Imam says, you will never reach Ray. We can't give you rain, but know this much. Oh, Amr ibn Sa'ad, it is as if I see in front of my own eyes you sleeping on a bed and killed while you sleep on that bed, your head severed from your body, placed upon a spear, and the children of Kufa shall stone your head. And this is exactly what's happened to Amr ibn Sa'ad. Post Karbala, he never even reached the governorship of Ray. But you see what binds him to the dunya. You see what makes him a slave, which won't allow him to be free. He can't be free because he's bound. He's like, my children, my wealth, I can't. But yet on the other side, you have these individuals that have left everything they know. have gone through great difficulty to reach Karbala, to go through that thirst with Abba Abdullah. To go through that difficulty and they're not bound that that is a free individual a free man is the one not ala zahir in the societies in the west that we live in that freedom is as many clothes as you can take off or whoever you want a relationship you can have that's not freedom true freedom is when i transcend beyond what society defines as norms and i attach myself to a greater power a power that frees me from all the boundaries of this world imagine not having to wake up one day and worry about putting food on my table See, there's a difference between working. I'm not saying we just sit out and be like, yeah, Allah, and do something. And then, you know, for you did it for Hazrat Maryam, I need something as well. I'm not saying that. The point is that imagine not having that worry, not having that anxiety, not having those depressive thoughts. It still requires a person to work. But it requires yaqeen in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns around in uh, Hadith Qudsi to the Holy Prophet. He says, Oh Ahmad, there are three groups of my servants. I'm shocked at three groups of my servants. The first group that the, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says is that Abd that knows I have provided his risk for him since the day he was born until this day and he still stays awake worrying about tomorrow. He's still anxious about tomorrow. When one places their total trust in Allah, that is how they become hurt. They become free from all of these worries, these things that bind them that stress them out, that keep them awake in the middle of the night. These individuals are there in Karbala, free from everything. Abu Thamama is Sayyidawi. He goes out, recites this line of poetry. He's killed and Zahir and Imam doesn't even reach his body because this is a wrong concept that we have that Imam went to every single body. He didn't go to every single body at most he went to the majority of the bodies of Bani Hashim and at most five to six of the bodies of the companions. Because many of them would fight in groups, many of them would go out 
and the war was so intense that Imam couldn't reach the body of every single one. So Abu Thamama Sayyidawi is one of those individuals that Imam doesn't reach his body. However, you see that ma'rifah that Abu Thamama has in his poetry. How his yaqeen is, arrows are flying, the heat of battle, and he's thinking that I need to pray. I'm sitting in my air-conditioned office. I'm sitting, you know, relaxing at home. And the time of salah is coming and going, and I'm afraid of asking my boss for a place to pray. Or I can't be bothered to get up from in front of the TV. Who is Hur? Is Abu Thamama free or am I free? Does he have true freedom or do I have true freedom? He wasn't bound by anything, not even arrows, spears, nothing. But here I am, with all the ease, but yet none of the ma'arifah. There is a difference between those two freedoms. He has he understands Ahl al-Bayt. You know, if we break down what he says, he says that they are the possessors of God's knowledge. After the Holy Prophet, Khuzan al-Ilm. In Ziyarat Jami'a Kabira, when we address Ahl al-Bayt, we address them as Khuzan al-Ilm. That they possess Ilm al-Ghayb. They have access to that divine knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Holy Quran says as well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not give access to Ilm al-Ghayb illa man ijtaba, illa man irtaba, except the ones he selects, except the ones that he deems allowed to access that knowledge. Ahl al-Bayt not only possess knowledge of the dunya and the akhirah, but they possess control over every single atom in the known universe. They possess that knowledge. And this is what, you, they possess that control over every atom. And this is Abu Thamama, he's saying, Dawi, he's coming and he's saying that. Having that ma'rifah. Then the second thing that he says to the imam, he understands the universality of the stance of Sayyidu Shahada. Says, let the people of the East, the condolences to the people of the East and the West. He knows that the message of Sayyidu Shahada is universal. It's wrong when we say Imam Hussein stood for humanity. He didn't. A byproduct of his stand is that he became hope for humanity. Imam Hussein alayhi salam stood only and solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the religion. And because he had that true stance and that true ma'rifah of Allah and the true dedication towards the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a byproduct of that, he saved humanity and he became the figurehead of all those that are free. It's not that Sayyidu Shuhada stood for humanity. Sometimes we try and reduce the Imams to our level. The Imams are far greater than this. Their levels, their ma'rifah is far beyond this. Abu Thamama understood this. But how is it that we too maintain that hurma of Ahl al-Bayt? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. He says, Arba'atu wa ana shafi' yawm al qiyamah. He says, Four things if a person has, I will be the intercessor for that person on yawm al qiyamah. What are those four things? He says, The first, Al mu'inu li ahli bayti. The person that helps my ahl al bayt. How does one go and help Ahl al-Bayt? Those that can command every atom in the universe. What does Rasulullah mean? Al-Mu'inu li Ahl al-Bayt. He says, how? Attending the dhikr of Ahl al-Bayt. This is aiding Ahl al-Bayt. Aiding the message of Imam al hussein Keeping alive their messages. Attending the majalis. Taking part in the azadari. Keeping alive the azar 
of Imam Al Hussein. These are those ways that one helps Ahl al Bayt. Praying on time. Where Amir al Mu'mineen says to uh, Uthman ibn Hanif, he says, Ibn Hanif, it has come to when he sends him to Basra, he says, it's come to my knowledge that you went to the gathering of the rich people of your city. And there they served you many foods on large plates. Abu Thamama, know that Ali, your Imam, satisfies himself in his life with only two loaves of bread and two pieces of cloth on his body. Ali does not like that you go to such places of opulence, but I know that you cannot live like me, Ali, but at least aid me, help me through your simple living and your abstinence. It says, aid us, help us through your simple living and your abstinence. This is the first group, the ones that aid Ahl al Bayt, that help Ahl al Bayt. Al Qadi lahum hawa'ijuhum, and the ones that fulfill the wishes of Ahl al Bayt, i.e., they work for them, they work for the deen. Individuals that pay their khums from amongst the hawa'ij of Ahl al Bayt. They go, they fulfill the, the requirements of the deen, the requirements of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from them. The third thing amongst those that fulfill the hawaj of Ahlul Bayt says those that love us, then they should also love our Shias. Not that we divide ourselves on the basis that this person doesn't speak the language that I speak, or this person doesn't do matam in the style that I do matam. Says no. Says man ahabbana, those that love us, love our Shias. Me, we have this love, this affinity towards other mu'mineen, towards other lovers of Amir al mu'mineen. We make sure that our children, their best friends, are the followers of Ahl al-Bayt. This is how one maintains a deen in, in the state or in, the, in an area of kufr. That you bring, for, bring together the families, make the children their best friends to be amongst the followers of Ahl al-Bayt. Because many individuals will be dragged to hell as a result of their friends. The Holy Quran says that a group will be dragged and they will be crying out, Oh, woe unto me! Lam fulan and khalila. How I wish I hadn't taken this person to be my friend. It's how I wish I hadn't taken this person to be my friend. So there are those that aid us in fulfilling the wishes of Ahlul Bayt. And they love and they love Ahl al Bayt with their hearts and their tongues. Not only is that love in their heart, but they bring it to their tongues. They show and they speak out of their love of Ahl al Bayt. Their actions show that they love Ahl al Bayt. And then the final thing is that they aid us with their hands, they aid us with their actions their tongue, their heart, their hands, their very wujud is their aiding Ahl al-Bayt, showing respect to others, showing and embodying the akhlaq of Ahl al-Bayt. Not being from amongst those that are the sababun, those that are the swearing people, people who curse. Yeah? And there is a difference between, when we say curse, unfortunately in English, this has become totally misinterpreted. Curse, and we say, no, no that means la'an. No, la'an is different. La'an is du'a. It comes from bara'a. When one does tabarra, it's from bara'a, that I seek distance. To do sab is haram. I'll give you an example. One of the companions of Amir al-Mu'mineen in the Battle of Sifin fights his way towards the army of Muawiyah, and they hear someone swearing at Imam Ali. This individual turns around and he swears at Muawiyah. When he returns, Amir al-Mu'mineen says, it has come to my knowledge that you swore at my enemy. Imam Ali, 
his companion, Battle of Siffin, his companion swears at his enemy, Muawiyah, who's swearing at Amir al Mu'mini. So he says, Ya Amir al Mu'mini, he was swearing at you. Amir al Mu'mini tells him, he says, No. He says, Ali does not like his followers to be from amongst the people of Sab, from amongst the swearing people. He says, If you swear again, know that I, Ali, wants nothing to do with you. There is a difference between Sab and La'an. The two different things to curse at all or to do la'an. When we do la'an, it's Allahumma la'an. Oh Allah, remove your mercy from this individual. But often now in our culture, it's become that, you know, we start using certain words for the enemies of Ahlul Bayt that are considered swearing. And even Ahlul Bayt themselves have turned around and said, we don't want anything to do with this. These individuals that are there in Karbala are free, are hor. Sayyidu Shulana is saying, Kunu ahraran fi dunyakum. At least be free men in your world. A person can be bound and a slave to his desires, can be a slave to hatred, can be a slave to anger, can be a slave to lying, can be a slave to his children, can be a slave to wealth and his job. But to where Sayyidu Shahada is standing in Karbala, he said, Kunu ahraran fi dunyakum. If nothing else, be free men. Men that have no fear. Sa'id ibn Abdullah stands in front of Sayyidu Shahada as the Imam is praying namaz behind him, the namaz of Dhuhr, that Abu Thamama Sayyidawi asked for. Says that as the Imam was praying, Saeed was running left to right, catching arrows in his body. When Saeed falls to the ground, Sayyid al Shahada takes his head in his lap. Says, Saeed, is there anything Hussein can do for you? He says, Yes, Yabn Rasulillah. Answer one question for me. Says, What is that question? He says, Our fate to Yabn Rasulillah. Have I been looking? Loyal to you, O oh son of Rasulullah. See how free these individuals were. Not bound by the worries of this world. Not even bound by the worries of Jannah. Free. Have I been loyal to you, Yabna Rasulullah? And every single one of those companions of Sayyidu Shahada. Is free from the youngest to the eldest. Even those as young as Qasim ibn al Hassan. What does a 13 year old child understand of death? But I look at the life of Al Qasim <coughs> and I see how is it that this child, so free from all the worries of the dunya, and his uncle comes to him and he says to his uncle, Uncle, will I too be killed tomorrow? He says to him, Ya Bunay, kayfa andik al mawt? My son, how do you perceive death? Says, Ya Am, ahla min al asal. Oh, uncle, it is sweeter to me than honey. The day of Ashura dawns, Asim comes constantly towards his uncle asking for permission to go out and fight. Abu Abdullah keeps on turning him away. They say the final time Qasim came to his uncle, the Maqtal says, Lam yazal wa He was constantly kissing the hands and the feet of his uncle. That uncle, give me permission to go out and fight. Uncle, give me permission to go out and give my life for you. Abu Abdullah looks towards him. He holds his nephew. He says, I've given you permission. But then the Maqtal says that they hugged each other and both uncle and nephew you cried so much for both of them fainted 
When they gained consciousness again, Abu Abdullah prepares Qasim, but yet there is no armor that will fit Qasim. Qasim is mounted upon his horse wearing only a shirt and sandals in his feet. Abu Abdullah ties the sword around his waist. Now Qasim upon the horse, he turns out, he rides out. He begins addressing the enemies. He says, if you do not know who I am, then know I am the son of Hassan, the son of Rasulullah. And I here defending my uncle Hussein, surrounded by you. Hamid ibn Muslim says, we saw a young boy leave the tents of Abu Abdullah, his face shining like a bright moon. He says, we saw that the boy was only wearing a shirt upon his body. The boy was so short that his feet would not reach the stirrups of the horses and we saw that the boy was wearing sandals the, 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 the strap of the left sandal was broken says the boy rode out he began fighting it says that we surrounded him from every side they began to attack Qasim one man by the name of al azadi turns to Hamid ibn Muslim he says by Allah I will cause the mother of this child to cry over him Hamid says I turn to him and I said, will you strike this child? He says, by Allah, watch me. As Qasim's back is turned, he strikes the head of Qasim with so much force. They say that the helmet of Qasim broke and the sword reached the head of Qasim. Now Qasim unable to stay upon his horse. Now all the other shuhada, when they fell from the horse, they cried out, assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. But Qasim was so young that when he fell from the horse, he cried out, Ya Amma Adrikni, Oh Uncle, come and aid me. They say Abu Abdullah rode out as Qasim came. As Qasim came to the ground, Abu Abdullah rides out ferociously. He comes towards Al Azadi, he strikes him, he kills him, making him fall from the horse. The army seeing Abu Abdullah, they begin riding from the left to the right away from Abu Abdullah. As the horses gallop from the left to the right, they say there was a meek voice heard from amongst the galloping horses. Oh, uncle, I can't take it anymore. They say that as the horses dispersed and the dust began to settle, Hussein was standing over the head of the boy and the boy was kicking his feet and his hands in the earth. Abu Abdullah stands over the body of Qasim. Oh Qasim, it is difficult for your uncle that you called him and he could not answer. And if he were to answer, it was too late. Then they, saw, they said, we saw Hussein bend down. He lifted up the boy. He lifted up the boy and he placed his chest on his chest. And he began walking back. But the feet of the boy were dragging along the earth, making lines in the sand. You may think, why is it that a boy that was so short at the start that he could not reach the stirrups of the horses? But now as he goes back, a fully grown man holds his body and still the boy's feet are dragging along the ground. They say that when Qasim fell and the horses began to run, they say the body of Qasim was trampled, his bones broken. Abu Abdullah now lifts the elongated body of Qasim. They say he takes the body back towards the tent. He takes it to the tent where his son Ali Akbar is. Abu Abdullah lays the body of Qasim down. He lays down in between both his son and his nephew. He places one hand on the chest of Ali Akbar, one hand on the chest of Qasim. Then Hussein calls out, Oh Allah, bear witness that this nation has taken both these sons of mine. <laughs> 
إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the sake of these tears. Ya Allah, forgive our sins. Ya Allah, forgive the sins of our parents. O oh Allah, those of our parents that are alive, give them long lives. Those of our parents that have left this world, give them a place of Sawal Muhammad in Jannah. O oh Allah, those who are ill, give them shifara. Those who are in debt, clear their debts. Those in education, make them successful. O oh Allah, Keep safe the Azadar of Sayyid al-Shahda around the world. O oh Allah, destroy the enemies of Azadari both internal and external around the world. O oh Allah, keep safe the Zaireen of Sayyid al-Shahda around the world. Ya Allah, hasten the reappearance of the Imam of our time and allow us to be amongst his true Muntadreen, his true awaiters. At the end there is a request for the recitation of Surah Fatiha for the following Marhumeen. Sayyid Jawad Haider, son of Sayyid Irshad Ali. Sayyid Irshad Ali Shah, son of Sayyid Ali Rasul. Uh, Rashida Begum, daughter of Sayyid Khurshid al Hassan Zaidi. Sayyid Shahzad Haider, son of Sayyid Irshad Ali Shah. Meher Sultan Masuma Bibi. And all your Marhumeen and those Marhumeen that have no one to recite for them, please honor their souls with the recitation of Surah Fatiha, three times Surah Ikhlas. But before that, the loudest of your salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. <laughs>